Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Accommodation Show. It's good to have you watching and listening. This week I'm joined by the wonderful, the amazing Dale Smith coming all the way from host and stay in the UK. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bart. No, thank you for having me. Really looking forward to it. Now, one thing that I do know is that it's almost midnight where you are. Whereabouts are you coming from? It is, yeah. So just before midnight, I am in the northeast of England, so North Yorkshire, a little place called Saltburn right on the North Yorkshire coast. Yeah, and uh, the reason why I bring that up is because today's episode is going to be about scaling your business. And you've managed to scale your business with your family from zero properties all the way through to, I think it's around about 850 as of time of recording. And yep. there's a certain amount of work and dedication which is required and doing phone calls with an Australian all the way across the other side of the world on a Sunday as well. Yep. <laughs> um, it does take quite a bit, huh? It does, yeah. It's uh, yeah, a lot of time, you know, ups and downs and trials and tribulations, so to speak. But um, but no, it's been it's been fantastic, great journey so far, and and looking forward to what lies ahead as well. Yeah, awesome. Look, uh, so look, th- thanks for thanks for joining. Thanks for taking the time out to do this. And we had had a conversation the other day. Um, about your business and I just found it absolutely fascinating uh, fascinating your growth story your trajectory a lot of your philosophy as well and I think it's important that people uh, tune into this bit and listen because they're gonna learn about how you do things which is quite often with property magic companies especially as they're scaling everyone has their own little secret source and ideas about how to scale and how to grow and what's great is that you don't bring it through just an ideas you've actually had that experience and that practical um, uh, the, the practical knowledge of doing it in your business that you can now share with everyone. So I, I really appreciate it. But before we get going, tell me a little bit about um, the company. Uh, tell me about where you guys are based and what you're doing and what it kind of looks like at this uh, at this moment. Yeah, cool. So, uh, so Horse and Stay, we're vacation rental management or holiday let management, as we would say in the UK. Um, the brand originated in December 2018. So we actually had nine holiday homes at that point in time. Our our journey started back in early 2017 with our first holiday home. Uh, that's what really got us hooked. That's what got me hooked on, on holiday let investing. Um, and I say we launched the Horse and Stay brand the end of 2018 with nine properties under management. Um, so we scaled pretty quickly uh, from nine to just under 900 in, in four and a half years. Um, and I say we're, we're a family business, so the family's been heavily involved in the early years, but we're now over 350 employees across the host and stay business and our wider group. Um, so it's uh, you know it's been a bit of a different journey so far, but um, a really good one. And uh, you kind of give, given it away already. The the employee thing is something which we will be talking about. Is the difference between uh, using contractors and actually having employees in this kind of business? So we'll come back to that um, a little bit later on because I think there'll be a huge amount of value that you'll be able to provide in terms of your philosophy and your thinking. Now, um, I think that the, the the way that you start is quite a traditional way to start, where um, people have got a bunch of properties, they start off with one or two, and then other people say, "Hey, can you do this for me?" Uh, and then all of a sudden, you've got you've got a business. Yep. Absolutely, exactly that part. So we bought our first, our own first holiday, let's say early 2017. That escalated into other people that we knew, you know, friends of family, etc. And asked us to, to start and manage their property for them. We went and bought a second. And that's when we, we thought, right, you know, we've, we've got something that's working. We're a bit different in the marketplace. So uh, the UK holiday let marketplace, you know, five, six years ago was, I would say, very traditional. So a number of bigger players in the market, um, quite capital intensive to start up to really drive direct bookings. Obviously, we were coming at it from a different angle. Uh, heavy usage initially of the likes of Booking.com and Airbnb. We've, you know, we've we've moved away from sole reliance on those channels, but they're still a massive part of our business. Um, and and we approached it from a full management perspective. We approached it really from a more residential property management uh, space than than a holiday let management space, and that really gave us a, a point of difference in the marketplace. Um, you know, that helped to secure some of those early contracts. 
Uh, and then, say, end of 2018 was when we thought, right, we've really got something. Let's create a brand that we can really drive this forward with. Um, and that's when we, we really started to get the wheels turning, really to start to scale the business. Um, and now kind of our wider group as well provides ancillary services that are focused around our host and stay clients providing things from interior design, legal services, construction, all really designed to facilitate that end to end journey for a client. So look, that's fascinating. One of the things that you brought up there that I hadn't really contemplated or considered was that huge growth of property management companies and people piling into the industry. I think for a lot of people, it was because the OTAs, be it Airbnb, Booking.com, and these platforms enabled someone that might not technologically be um, advanced or really understand how to build a website or how to do marketing, but it allowed them all to jump into the space really quickly and get going. Because I always thought about it as you know, if you want to be a real estate agent, you've got a you've got quite a few hoops to jump through. If you want to get into yeah. hotels, then you you need a huge amount of capital to get into there, or you've got to work your way through the business. But here, you can get into it and. You've got the one part is all the technical skills of how do you host and that sort of thing, but then you've yeah. got all the all the all the technology skills which people yeah. just didn't really need to have, and they could kind of switch it on and the business is going. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. I mean, if we compare ourselves to you know, Sykes and Travel Chapter and Cottages.com in the UK, are our biggest competitors. Um, you know, those guys have started ten plus years ago ultimately, capital intensive, technology intensive. Airbnb and Booking.com really opened the door to us to being able to to grow a business with with little to no capital, um, and we just focused on really leveraging those platforms because with the best will in the world, we're never going to compete with the reach of Booking.com and Airbnb and some of the other large uh, large scale OTAs, and, and neither are our bigger competitors either. Even though I think some of them uh, perhaps believe that they can compete with them, for me, I see those guys as a partner. It's about mm-hmm. generating that booking and retaining the guest. But when we first started off, for us, it was about how do we really um, showcase that individual property? So how good are the interiors? How good is the photography? You know, my, my biggest thing is that first photograph and the next four have got to sell that property in 30 seconds. Yet a lot of people seem to miss that on the OTAs. I mean, how many times do you scan down Airbnb and you look at, the pictures and just think, you know, what's that first image all about? Why are people not taking more care with what that first image is and really attracting that potential guest in? And I think in the early days, we just leveraged to me what were some really basic marketing skills deployed on <laughs> those platforms that allow you to reach the guests. Um, and, and we got really good results off the back of that. Um, and I think that's that's something that some people have, have missed. And, and ultimately, it's, uh, it's it's getting those basics right to really you know design professional photos, one of the, the two of the kind of key things that we built our business on. It, it, that just brings so much up. And for me, being in the marketing world, I'm just so tempted to be pulled <laughs> in this direction about <laughs> how do you optimize listings, but not for today. Yeah. Nice try. <laughs> no, because it's such a, I, I love it. It just gets me super excited. And it's something that I think about a lot. But I want to f- uh, jump back and focus on this journey. So um, uh, your how was through having some properties, getting referrals, then using uh, the OTAs to then get the people coming in. Yeah. Now, yeah. what I find is that people will generally get to, you know, from 10 properties to 30 properties to 50 properties to 100 properties to this kind of referral network. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about sort of some of those those moments, which are those barriers that you kind of have to push through is it a certain number of properties where you're like oh we're at 100 now oh my god we've got all these problems that we have to fix or is it at 300 or kind of what are those different steps that people need to think about that they don't know that they're going to face when they're doing this growth journey yeah i think the first one i speak to a lot of people who seem to get stuck 100 properties seems to be a real a real barrier um, and it, it wasn't a particularly difficult barrier for us to, to break through. But I'm a big, back to your point of marketing, I'm, I'm a big believer in marketing. We have marketed our business from day one. I'm a big believer in brand. Um, arguably, we if you ask my dad anyway, arguably we overspend on, on marketing. Hmm. Um, I don't see it as that. I see it as a real investment in, 
in the business and, and ultimately from a marketing point of view, I, I always think you're marketing for two or three years ahead. And we have done that from day one. I think that's what's allowed us to keep on scaling. Um, I think in terms of those challenges, we really saw the difference. The first step around 12 or 15 properties, that's when we changed our PMS software from a, um, a really simple PMS into a more complex PMS that allowed us to, to leverage our time much better. I think then once we hit 25 properties, that was another stepping stone. Then, then 50 properties, I think the kind of doubling factor is when you really start to see the changes in and requirements to change a business. Um, you know, less. Can I can I jump? In, can I jump? Yeah, can I jump in? Sorry, sorry, because this is this is goal. This is what people want to hear. So the PMS, of course. Um, what's interesting is a lot of people that come into the industry now, they'll already be quite aware of PMSs and that, you know, yeah. maybe from the outset, they'll have, have that all organized and arranged, which is great. But also, if you are getting into the industry and if you're brand new, don't let that be a barrier to stop you. You're much better off picking up properties, working on the business rather than figuring out the PMS because you can list without a PMS. Let's be clear on that. But yeah. that the 25 and the 50 those two moments, uh, a bit of a surprise. Why do you think they were um, barriers or inflection points for you? Um, I just think in terms of this, I think there's, there's certain points where if you've got a person, let's say, so you know, at that point in time, let's say 25 properties, myself and my sister were handling most of the guest communications between us and then she was handling the housekeeping side of things. And then once we got up to 50, we needed an additional person to start and to start and do that so i think every time the businesses or the portfolio has doubled in size you're bringing in at least another person perhaps another two people and for me it ends up being really a headcount ratio game if i look at our business now our ratios don't don't really change so as the business scales we've got a nice methodology with where we know right if we bring another 150 properties on board that for us means another head housekeeper it means another property manager needs to come on board. I think we did mm -hmm. that from early on in, in, in our journey really was identifying certain metrics where we knew, right, this role can look after X number of properties. Once we reach that next point, then we need to bring that person in again. And I think I think as you if you're looking to scale the business, you need to start and get an idea on what those what those roles will look like and how many properties you can fit within a certain role. And you might be wrong, but you know, you might you might miss it by 10, 20 properties or you might put the person in too early or you might put them in too late. But it's just starting to think about that and actually having a, um, you know, an eye on the future. If you want to scale up to 50 properties, 100, 200, well, what does your team look like then? How are you going to plan towards that? I think some of the, those are some of the critical things to, to think about. And actually, it'll also pull you along. We've always been, you know, believers in, in kind of setting setting high targets uh, and, and trying to drive to, towards those. You and I chatted on our first call about, uh, you know, so <laughs> BHAGs. For me, that's a massive part of, of what we do. The first year that we, you know, we launched the Horse and Stay brand, our ambition was to have 100 properties in year one. We got to 57, I think the number was. So we didn't hit our target, but to go from, from nine to 57 in a year was a, a big step forward for us. So I think setting some of those ambitious targets pulled you along that as well. Let's uh, let's do it. What's a B hag? So a big hairy audacious goal. Okay, and uh, uh, tell me about your philosophy as you've been growing your business around a big hairy audacious goal because um, this uh, concept came out of a book. I forget the name of the book off the top of my head. I wish I had a, a producer in the back that say, "Yeah, it's this one." <laughs> there uh, but I'll put it in the show notes uh, for anyone that's uh, that's listening. It's one of the most entrepreneurs and founders will have encountered the idea of a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, and obviously it's all in the name, but tell me about uh, sort of you and your business and how you set it and, and uh, what your thinking was. Yeah, we, I guess it's, it's kind of, um, it's always been a philosophy in mind, really. I mean, I, I learned about BHAGs and goal setting in my, my previous career, really, which was in the automotive industry. I had a, a really fantastic chief exec who took me under under his wing, and I learned so much of him, which I applied to the business, and kind of goal setting and really setting elevated goals that you can work towards that, you know, in the back of your mind, you might think, well, I know they're a super stretch target, but 
if we get even halfway or 75 percent of the way towards those we know we've we've done a really good job and i think it just it just keeps you moving along towards them and i guess there's a balance on not setting them so high that you feel they are you know completely unachievable um they've they've got to keep you engaged and keep you focused and, and keep you to moving towards that target and you know we we set those you know every single year in the business in terms of what our goals are going to be um and and we would we would normally pick three within each of our businesses or within each of our departments that are going to be our our BHAGs for for each of those um each of those brands or each of those departments that they can work towards across the year um and it just gets you think i think the good thing with setting super high objectives is it makes you think differently it makes you think outside the box you you can't think in a um, a kind of traditional or, or standard way of doing it. You've got, you've got to think differently to be able to achieve and hit those goals. Um, and again, I, I certainly think that's what's enabled us to scale as quickly as we had. We, we've, you know, we are quite different to most holiday let operators in the UK. We, um, you know, we'll touch on it, but our all of our operations are in house. No one else is really doing that to the scale that we are. But that, that's what we believe in. Again, we think that's. One of the key reasons we've been able to scale as quickly as we have done because our offer is really attractive from that point of view. So we've always tried to look and go, right, well, what are the traditional guys doing? How does the you know, how do the OTAs play and they're you know, they're a different model, but what are they doing from a, a scale and technology point of view? And how can we apply the best of both in our business to to give us a, a, a unique point of difference, I suppose. But yeah, certainly back on the goals, I'm a, a big believer on setting them high and, and running as fast as possible towards them. I realized as we recall this episode that I don't know how we're going to get through everything that I want to ask you in <laughs> this short period of time. So maybe this is going to be a, a two-parter for us if I can get you out of bed yeah. or, or keep you awake for long enough. Yeah. But look, um, uh, the big hairy audacious goal. I want to I want to close that one off, and we do need to go yeah. back and uh, back into talking about that scaling journey. So for everyone, when you're talking about these goals, um, the example that I like to give is, and I don't know whether this is Elon Musk's. BHAG, but this is how I see it in my mind, right? Because he's always doing audacious things. Now, mm-hmm. an audacious goal would be for him to travel to the moon, right? That's an mm-hmm. audacious goal. A big, hairy, audacious goal is going to Mars. I'm going to go to Mars. Mm-hmm. I'm going to set up a colony there, right? For most people, you would say, that's impossible. You're never, ever going to do it. It's never been done before. But it's a big, hairy, audacious goal, which they've set. And then they're doing everything around it to get there. So within that, let's get to the moon. Let's use get a reusable rocket. Let's do all these different yeah. bits and pieces. Yeah. So when you're thinking about it for your hotel, motel, um, uh, any accommodation business, you want to set a goal for the business in terms of it could be revenue, it could be number of properties, it could be gross debt, it could be something personal. I want to only work 20 hours a week. That can be a big, hairy, audacious goal right? Whatever it is for you and your business, it's important to set it, but don't make it too easy because that's not audacious. You can have an audacious goal, have a big hairy one, but not too much so that's unachievable Unachievable because then if you talk to your team and you say, hey, we're trying to get to Mars and they're like, it's never going to happen and you've got no idea how you're going to get there. You've got no ideas whatsoever. You know that's probably impossible, but there's a way. You've got to be careful because you've got to motivate your people in the right way. Now the question for you is when you were setting your goals, was it one year, two years, and five years? And what kind of metrics were you putting around those goals? So, yes, yeah, so we, we were setting, at that point in time, one and three year goals. So if, we, if I look at where we were um, when, we launched, when we launched the brand, it was one and three year goals. Now now we'll set one year, three year, five year goals. I'll have you know, some things in, in my head really that um, are still further ahead than that probably you know, up to up to 10 year goals in terms of where we want to be but those are the ones that for me you know change on a on a monthly quarterly basis depending on um on what's going on really um but i think for the team i always try and keep the immediate team focused on on the annual goal so you know going into this year as an example from an organic growth point of view in our host and stay business we want to bring on board 40 new properties a month organically so you know that's that that's our our target from that point of view um if we look at where we want to be in three years time we want to be at five thousand properties so that's a that's a stretch for us we know we're going to continue to grow organically acquisition is going to need to play into that 
But again, we're we're a self-funded and debt-funded businesses. A uh, business we've got no equity investment at the moment. So, you know, the the the, the BHAG for me on getting to five thousand units is, is is can we do that organically and through self-funding and debt-funding? Because you know a lot of that hasn't really been been done yet before. So, and um, that's a real big one for us at the moment. Bit of a, bit of a puzzle. I love it, and thanks for sharing. Um, I you know that that ambition really has to be there, and and. Uh, I think the one thing that happens when we talk about our BHAGs and our goals, one is there is some consideration that you put into it. It's not just taking a number out of out of the air. I've had uh, leadership in the past who have told me that you know they just get a BHAG or they just go, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make fifty million, and you're like, okay, we're we're not even part of the way there yet. You know, how have you considered this? And they like, oh, no, we haven't. Okay, so you got you don't have that, but it's clear that your goal has been considered and you've had some thought around it and that yes it's probably going to really stretch us but we're going to find a way to do it i need to go back to where we were before which is the number of properties so we've got these inflection points we've said um 25 50 100 and then we're doubling yeah um for that growth that you've had uh apart from sort of those challenges uh, along the way, or actually the one question I do want to ask, um, when you're adding staff, mm-hmm. quite often the staff takes away your profit uh, yeah. and it also it inhibits you from also scaling it in another way. Um, yeah. And quite often you'll actually hire someone and they'll be more expensive than the revenue that they actually justify bringing in until you scale to, to a certain point. What's your philosophy yeah. around that? I think that one really comes down to whether the profit is essential for you in in the given year or whether um and and is is the profit essential for your living i suppose i think that's the key thing from a uh, you know business owner founder point of view for us it's always been about the the future growth so we've you know happily invested in in staff and probably invested early in staff so I would always be looking the same, right, in six months time, we want to be at X number of properties. So really three months before that, I need to be bringing the staff in place so that I've got a training period so they're ready for that. The last thing I want to be doing is bringing them in last minute, trying to train them and, and having issues that then causes brand reputation issues, etc. So we've always tried to invest early and grow the revenue up to the headcount. And it's difficult to say whether there's a right or wrong way to do it. If you're running the business really lean, then that's not as, you know, it's not possible to do that. If you're super reliant on the income the business is generating, then again, you're probably going to sacrifice more of your time for, for that money than you are then your staff's time for that. So I think a lot of that comes down to a personal question in, in terms of how reliant are you on the, the annual profits in the year and how much of it can you delay that profit to accumulate more profit over time. And for us, it's about the accumulation of profit over time. We're consistently reinvesting in the business. You know, we, you know, you know, cards on the table, we invested 1.2 million last year in marketing. We we could have been five, six, 700,000 pounds more profitable in the year last year. But a lot of that is investment for two years and three years. It's brand investment to build goodwill value in the brand for, for years ahead. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of that. but. If you're solely trying to say, right, what's the best possible EBITDA we can achieve in the year, I wouldn't be making those type of investments because I'd be more focused just just year to year and year to year performance than really looking ahead and trying to drive future performance. We're going to hopefully, if you'll indulge me, uh, come back and do an episode about marketing. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a, yeah, I think a space that we both absolutely love, and I can just yeah. tell I've got so many uh, questions <laughs> for you about about that. I mean, obviously, spending spending that amount of money uh, is significant, and you'll have a lot of learnings from from it. Um, uh, and I, I love that love that idea that one you want to make sure that you've got enough to live, and then two you're making a decision as to when you want to start taking out your profits from the business and sort of scaling back on that growth trajectory. Yeah. Um, so, and obviously you're being measured in terms of hiring your staff and, and what you're doing. Now let's get onto that. Um, uh, so yeah. part of your journey in that, that journey to scale to the, to the number of properties you have right now, a lot of it's your people. Tell me about the equation of how important the people are and tell me your philosophy about, uh, hiring recruitment and, and that side yeah. of, of, of growing your business. Yeah. I mean, the, the people are essential. Absolutely. And I, I think. 
on the people side of things in our industry, I think we sometimes get caught up with the technology side of things. And you know, so many times I've been at a lot of conferences the last two months and the topic of scaling through software and technology always seems to be on the agenda, but scaling and getting the right people in place and the on the ground people never seems to be on the on the agenda. Maybe it's not quite as uh, as quite as sexy, but for me, the people are essential. So if we look at our business composition at the moment, we're full management. So out of the 900 properties that we manage, 85% of those we do, the housekeeping or the booking generation, the housekeeping, the maintenance, the compliance, and that's delivered through our own in-house on the ground teams. And that's been something that's close to our heart. It's our USP. We want to manage quality end to end. And ultimately we want the book to start and stop with us. But that obviously gives us problems with scaling because we've got to be hiring consistently, training consistently. We've got to be, you know, exiting people that aren't performing, aren't to the right standard. Um, so we've had to put a lot of infrastructure in um, around that. You know, we've got a pretty sizable uh, people department for, for the size of business as well. Um, but for, for me, that's key. And also, I'm a big believer of driving local employment. So as we said earlier, we're based mainly in the north of England and quite heavily in the northeast of England. And we're one of the biggest employers in this area. And that's a that's a really big thing for me of us being able to reinvest into local employment, give local uh, people opportunities as well. Um, so it's kind of multifaceted, um, really, from that perspective. It's an essential part of our business because we are different in that we deliver the housekeeping, we deliver the, the maintenance through our own teams, not outsourcing to third parties and kind of you know passing the book to a certain degree. Um, but that enables us to, say, redeploy those funds back into uh, the local area as well and, and employ local people who, you know, who really want to do a good job at the end of the day. Um, but it, it certainly makes scaling more difficult doing it that way than if mm. we were to, to simply outsource and, and, and scale quickly across multiple regions. And that was my next question, uh, you're just leading me into it. So uh, I think there's massive benefits about having people on your team um, from a motivational point of view, from a career yeah. path point of view, um, from training, uh, getting people understanding your systems, your processes, how you work, your philosophy. I mean, even having parties that make sense where everyone's together, that sort of thing. Yeah. But being in the business that we're in, if you're running a hotel, it's a lot easier, right? Everyone's yeah. under one roof and, and off you go. Yeah. Uh, you're servicing, you know, 500 rooms or a thousand rooms. Uh, you're doing the thousand rooms, but in, in a thousand different locations, uh, yeah, yeah. which is far more complex of a puzzle to, to, to solve. Uh, then if you want to scale, so, you know, like when, you, when, when you come to Australia, then all of a sudden you've got to start again and you've got to, you've got yeah. to invest heavily to find your team, your people and build it up. And then you've yeah. got a scaling issue where if you've only got five properties, it doesn't make sense. So you need to get yeah. to 50 or hundred as quick as you possibly can. So you have to acquire, I guess, that's yeah, how you yeah. do it, right? If I answered it myself? Yeah, I suppose. So the num number, so you're interested, you're saying that, you know, got to get to 50 properties. So the number that we need, we need 12 properties in a within an area to make it worth mm. us then employing the on the ground staff. So when we first started out, it was a bit different because we were doing everything ourselves. So the number of properties didn't matter, you were scaling it up. But as we've moved into, into new areas, 12 is about the number that we can then put the on the ground operations in place and we'll put an on the ground in the operation in place we then work a 60 minute drive time in a kind of um, circular fashion 60 mile 60 minute drive time to service properties in that area if we're then looking at a new area we want a bit of crossover so our ideal would be to have you know some place here some place here and then you've got a 60 60 minute crossover between the, those two areas so you kind of you know, logically working your way into into new areas. If we were starting in a new area completely from scratch, then you're absolutely right. That's where we're looking as to grow across the UK. Acquisition needs to be a key part of that because if we're going to go into a territory completely fresh, we really need to go and acquire another business to get unit consolidation to be able to then to then grow that out organically just to be able to go into an area and start from scratch with zero properties is possible because obviously we've already done it once but it's it's much tougher in terms of then finding someone that can start that that's got kind of um i suppose the the experience or the, the entrepreneurial skills to start an area from scratch and be able to build that up so 
um, in terms of in terms of scaling now, it's kind of for us in the UK. It's geographically working our way from north mm-hmm. to south and expanding into new territories systematically, or us acquiring a core new territory that we can expand out from. Um, and from that territory, we would be looking for is one that already fits our existing client base from a guest point of view. So we're very coastal rural locations. So naturally, our guests will be drawn to additional coastal and rural um, locations across the UK. Yeah. So you're always speaking to the same avatar, back to yeah. marketing always, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah. that number, that 12, that 12, sorry, I, I'm not sure whether I understood correctly. So you're saying that you can start a new territory with a minimum of 12 properties and then have a team. Is that, uh, obviously yeah, it's exactly. not ideal, exactly. but yeah. you'd prefer to have something closer to another location. But you're saying you could pick a, a location out of anywhere and 12 would be enough to start that ground yeah, team. And can you tell yeah. me what that ground team would look like? So that for us, that would be having um, an, an operational kind of housekeeping manager, but a productive housekeeping manager in place. That's the first thing we would put in. So we want to control the on the ground housekeeping as early as we possibly can do because that controls the quality and it's the service that a lot of homeowners can't source elsewhere. That's the that's the one that's really constrained. From a maintenance point of view, we know we can outsource on maintenance to begin with and we can we could do that for a longer period of time before needing to pull that in. But housekeeping is the critical one for us because that's the one that gives you the control. It's the one that controls the quality. It's the one that, if it's wrong, is going to produce you again the bad reviews or the or the impact on your brand. So what we would typically do, we would take properties that are outside of our our full service area, if you like, where we where we can service with our existing team. We would outsource up to about twelve properties in a location using third party contractors. Once we're at that twelve, that's when we'd look at you know effectively bringing our own team in and then starting to scale it out on a, on a more rapid uh, more rapid timeline and uh, that do you said operational housekeeper i think that those yeah. are the words what what does that mean so we would just so be i'm, I'm not being facetious i just yeah, generally no, like what, what does that mean yeah. to you i guess so what, what i'd be expecting the first person that would go into an area for us on housekeeping would would be a housekeeper but one that can also build a team so they've also got the skill sets to be able to start and recruit and train a team underneath them so we're looking for someone that is you know more than purely a housekeeper again they've got aspirations or they've got the skill set already to be able to recruit to be able to re- uh, to train to be able to manage a schedule so we're not you know we're not looking for someone that just wants to go out and clean properties and and that's it we're looking for somebody mm-hmm. that can obviously do that but they can also start to build a team as well so if you know if you take my sister she was at, she when she came into the business full time she was out 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 there doing the housekeeping and the cleaning but she was also recruiting at the same time and building that team underneath her so that eventually she wasn't out cleaning she was managing the team so it's trying to find that right person that's got the skills to be able to do that which is easier said than done but you know that goes across the business <laughs> that's why you're, you're, you're constantly hiring and recruiting right yeah. and especially yeah. uh it, it depends on the territory that you're in as well right you can have some yeah. territories that are just impossible to find staff which is uh which is a big thing Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, people, HR, um, branding, using the, pl- the OTA pl- platforms where they should be, then yeah. obviously the marketing will come back to you in another episode. Um, uh, acquisition, we've talked about a little bit, um, mm-hmm. and that sort of organic growth path. Is there any, are there any final thoughts as we come towards the end of the episode in terms of closing off this growth journey that you feel we haven't covered yet? Um, no, I think, we, I think we've covered a lot there, definitely. I think, um, I think your recap's good. I think for me, you know, talking to any, any you know, new property managers out there, any looking to scale, I think it's about you know, getting your product right and what you stand for right, really. You know, back on that marketing point, I think being brand precious or quality precious is is essential and knowing what you what you're trying to deliver and what your brand stands for and what your quality stands for and and standing behind that because that's also what will attract more owners into your business definitely um and then i think is if you're looking to scale it's about it's about that forward plan it's about setting the goals that ultimately going to keep keep you dragging along that that growth journey and always looking ahead um and and getting the people in place as early as possible because that will help you and all all, also if you've got the people in place that will force you to grow because you need to keep on growing that revenue to to keep on making sure that it's profitable once you've got the people in place 
The last question that I have for you uh, is around numbers. And this is an area where I feel that a, a lot of people kind of get into it, just like with their technology yep. side. They might not be too familiar with it and maybe they never will be and you can just use the OTAs to get yourself going and, and it will cut a lot of corners for you. Um, you can learn how to get better at hospitality and looking after the guests and then you can learn about how to look after owners. Uh, but the one thing that I haven't seen great education on so far uh, in, in, in this space is good financial um, acumen. Uh, yep. business acumen that sort of stuff uh, I take it that within your family you've got a, a, a good background of that tell me give give me some tips and advice as to what people should be thinking about when they look thinking about their numbers yeah so I suppose so my, my backgrounds finance and marketing which is a funny combination I suppose but that's what really got me hooked on the on the holiday lets the vacation rentals because you could actually affect performance every single day and I think that is one of the key things is actually are you monitoring so if you've got if you've got a number of properties under operation at the moment so how are you measuring and monitoring your your occupancy your your adrs and your expected bookings on a daily basis and then what action are you actually taking off the back of those um i think fundamentals is is looking and saying right what am i expecting to generate revenue out of a property you know be that booking revenue but also then your management revenue and, and setting some basic objectives on it. You might set an objective and it might be wrong the first six months. So learn from that, readjust it, reset the objective if you need to. I think the key thing there is actually just getting started on picking out what are your what are your key measurements, what what's actually driving your business on a daily basis. Well, whatever those are, pick I always pick the, the biggest five. I always have, like to have five KPIs in my mind that I know we're tracking all the time and I know what they are all of the time. I think, you know, picking those out, measuring them, taking action on them. Once those ones are running nicely, pick another five that are going to move your business forward. So um, KPIs are critical for me. You can't operate a business uh, successfully without having KPIs. Key performance indicators are essential. Um, and ultimately, it's going to evolve off the back of that. You know, we have, you know, we have a KPI of two thousand pounds profit per property per year. That's that's one of ours. That's where we want to be. That's that's what we're planned at. For this year, last year it was a little bit lower because we were reinvesting from a marketing point or, or investing from a marketing point of view. This year, um, we're investing at a similar level to last year on marketing, so our profit per property has increased from a KPI point of view. Um, again, we have a KPI on bookings. We're, we're trying to generate 0.2 bookings per day per property on the portfolio, so that's a key one for me. When I get the report every morning, that's the first number that I look at. So I think it's just picking some... You know, there's no right or wrong on it. Pick the ones that you think are most essential to you in your business today. Pick five of them, track them, make improvements on them. Once you're happy with where they are, keep a tab on them, but pick another five that you need to improve. That'll keep your business moving forward. I love it. Um... I'm conscious of the time, Dale. I'm conscious yeah. of the time. I could talk to you for another hour or two, like literally. Um, we need to get you over to Australia. If not, I've been encouraging you to join me in Orlando in Florida for VRMA, yeah, so definitely. you best be there. Yeah. Um, get yeah. your tickets, find that, carve that, that space out, um, and yeah. that's in October, I think it is. October, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm already booked. Um, thank you for sharing your journey and your story with everybody. Well, thank you very and much. taking the time sure. very late in the day or early in the morning now yeah to, it was late in the day now it's course, early in the morning you're, you're, yeah that's right you're a man on a mission and of course networking and doing this sort of stuff is is beneficial um in terms of your networking but i think you're giving more than what you get in terms of spending the time with us and um and sharing your unique perspective and your unique knowledge with everybody um i want those people that are listening to this to appreciate how like some of this stuff it's real secret sauce it's real mm -hmm. secrets that you won't just get by sort of googling it or watching like unless you're watching this sort of stuff so i can't tell you how much i appreciate it and for me, what's amazing is how I learn from people like you that are out there doing it as well so that I can reshare it with my community. So thank you is uh, the, the operative uh, uh, two words 
here. Um, I hope that we can do an episode of marketing in the future, but I'll come back to yeah, you on that. And um, uh, what is the best way for people to stay in touch with you, follow your journey, or is there anything that you're looking for as well from people that might be listening to this? Uh, I think the best place to find me is probably LinkedIn. That's my uh, my most active social platform. So definitely uh, find me on LinkedIn, Dale Smith. You'll you'll find me Dale Smith host and stay no problem. Um, and I love to engage with people on there. Definitely, you know, I'm I'm always uh, willing to give back any advice I can give. I I absolutely will do. I'm a big believer in that. I think um, in terms of helping people progress, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a number of good mentors in my career and journey so far and, and they still help me along so I'm a, a big believer in that so please do reach out beautiful um, folks if you're listening to this on a podcast version please leave us a review it makes all the difference it helps us keep them going I was at a conference last week someone came up running up to me and said hey I've gone through your whole backlog whole backlog of episodes when are you going to do some more we can do more as long as we know that you're there out there listening and we're getting that kind of feedback so do let us know if you're on the youtube give us a, a hit that bell subscribe everything else you need to do to engage with our content and leave us your feedback let us know what you've got out of this episode and what you find most valuable dale thank you so much have a good sleep and we'll catch up again soon cool thanks for having me back